The next speaker will be uh, Michel Kalame, and uh, he is from Basel, from the physics department, and uh, he is going to talk about on-chip biochemical sensing using silicon nanoribbon felt effect transistors. And I'm really happy that we have done already half of our job because we start now with the second half of the <laughs> presentations of this uh, very long session. So, Michel, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Bert, for also for the occasion to be here today. And thank you for managing to survive at least until the first half and continuing still being here. Uh, I'm at the physics department of the University of Basel, and I'm also at the Swiss Nanoscience Institute. Uh, and we are interested essentially in uh, biosensing devices based on electronics. So it's a bit of switching gear, but as you say, we move towards electrons slowly now. So and this is here the title of the of the talk uh, that I'm showing here. So, so we became motivated to to towards diagnosis and and potentially also towards drug screening, thinking about the different possibilities that one needs in terms of, uh, of detection systems. Right? We would like to have detection systems for different biochemicals which are low costs. We would like to have time resolved, label free, quantitative, portable, cheap, and potentially also statistically relevant because more and more we are collecting large data sets when we try to do diagnosis and we need to be able to analyze the data in a proper way for that. So um, uh, ideally we would like to simplify point of care, point of prescription and possibly also home diagnostics to start to build this kind of vision devices. And there are some initiatives which are existing as you know already now trying to integrate all the electronics and the sensing and try to get the, uh, the information from only one droplet of blood for instance. So this is a tendency which is developing at the moment and a good, very good candidate to try to implement such systems would be silicon-based biochemical sensors. And essentially, silicon technology, as we all know, is uh, at large scale industrial today. Uh, we can achieve a high integration. And since, I would say, pretty much 10 years, silicon nanoribbons and nanowires has been, have been heavily investigated, in, uh, in particular on, uh, on top-down approaches and high integrative approaches to try to, to make this kind of, uh, of devices here, trying to detect different types of biochemicals here. So we try to transduce here the biochemical reactions into electrical signals, and this is the key point. Maybe one of the most prominent examples in the last years of such a system has been this implementation here on chip of the detection uh, of the DNA sequencing based by the ion torrent technology, um, I did, which was published in this paper here in 2011. Uh, the, the, this has been bought now by Thermo Fisher, but essentially that was going back to this 1,000 uh, US dollar uh, genome sequencing thanks to integration on silicon chips, right? So this is, this is one of example of how far silicon can also help us to, to detect. In this case, what was detected was pH changes, right? So this is the only thing that the silicon device in this case is, detection, is detecting. So let me show you briefly the kind of devices which we are using and how these guys are working. So here we have the different contacts of our, the two contacts of our uh, transistor. Uh, here is the channel which will conduct the, the charges. We have a gate oxide which is uh, protecting the top surface and we have an analyte or different analytes which are floating in solution and we control the potential of the solution here with an additional gate electrode. So what you see here is the conductance versus the gate voltage. And so this uh, reference voltage here which we apply here and this is the typical kind of signal which we observe when we are measuring the transport of these uh, FETs in this case here. This is, these are P-doped uh, structures. So what happens when additional analytes or, an adi or a larger, slightly larger concentration takes place in the solvent here, we start to have attachments of charged uh, analytes to the surface. This is shifting here the trace uh, or the, the, um, uh, the measurements that we have here. And if we keep further increasing, then we have an additional shift which is appearing into our signal here. So essentially what we are measuring or the signal which we are measuring here is the shift which we see here into, uh, into this curve. So what we do is that we select the preconductance and we measure here or we look here at what threshold voltage we are having our signal which is shifting. So this we can rationalize using uh, simple equations. Essentially, if we look at the difference between two voltage thresholds here, this relates back to the surface potential of, this, uh, of the nanowire and we can get back to, thanks to the Nernst equation, to essentially the pH change that has been taking place on top of the wire in this case. So if you have an oxide, thanks to protonation, deprotonation, we have this potential shift in this case. And so this is essentially the signal which we are measuring here. So this is how the chips look like. We have in this case 48 wires. You cannot see individual wires. You will see that in a second here we have four groups of uh, 12 wires which are implemented. 
we seal everything in epoxy after bonding on top of the chip. This is done by, uh, by standard E-beam uh, lithography. And we also encapsulate the whole system in a fluidic uh, uh, device in order to be able to address the different fluids. So you see here some of the nanowires. These are the implanted contacts that you see here, some additional contact lines here. The gray part is essentially a polymeric protection in order to define a, a microchannel at the top of the, uh, of the chip. And we flow the different solutions which we want to measure here. You see individual nanowires. Maybe for those in the back, this is the scale bar here is five micrometers. So this is the typical sizes which we have here. So again, this is a cross-section, schematic cross-section of the devices which we have. So we have the wire, the top oxide layer, uh, which is protecting the wire from the solution and the solution on top, and we control the potential of this solution here. So what we have been doing first with these kind of devices was to learn how they function. Can we measure pH, as has been claimed in the past years? And you see that here, conductance versus, again, the gate voltage in the solution here. And whenever the different types of oxides, which we have, in our case, we have been using aluminum oxide or hafnium oxide, uh, whenever these oxides get protonated or deprotonated, then we get a change in surface potential, and this is how we sh see shifts in this case here. So you can see the different traces at different pH going from 3 to 10, and you see the very nice shift that we get. So these two oxide surfaces here are giving very much the Nernst limit, 60 millivolt per pH of change. If you would use silicon dioxide, you would see something much lower, because silicon dioxide is not a good oxide for this kind of measurements, actually, also because of the diffusion of the ions through the, uh, the silicon dioxide. So this is working very nicely with this kind of devices, and over the past years, we could uh, look at this in, in, in some level of detail. The next step which we wanted to take was to start to functionalize the surface in order to detect specific ions. So I just don't want to see now uh, a change of a pH. I would like to see, for instance, here the detection, specific detection of sodium. So we have been using this kind of crown eater systems, which we have been binding at the top of the uh, surface of the wire. In this case, we were using an additional gold layer, and I will get back to this point after. Uh, this, this gives us an additional possible surface chemistry to bind things. And what you see here now is not only the direct measurements or the direct traces or the shift in threshold. What we have been doing here is to measure a wire which had this molecule functionalized at the top of the wire as compared to a wire that did not have that molecule. And we subtract both signals. That's why I call here differential signal, which I get here. And you see that with that, we can be totally passive versus pH. There's no sensitivity versus pH. No dependency on KCL. Potassium was not detected in this case, but thanks to the specificity of the crown eater or relative specificity of the crown eater for sodium here, we were able to have a very good detection of sodium in this case here. So by surface functionalizing these devices, we can go to specific detection here. So those systems work well. We have been doing that for different types of ions, sodium, potassium, calcium, or fluoride as well. We have been trying surface passivation. We have been investigating signal-to-noise ratio, trying to optimize also these aspects here. One aspect which we have been working on is competition effects, and I will get back to this. When two reactions can take place at the surface, it is very important to look at them in details because the fact that two reactions can happen, they will influence each other, and you will not be able to detect properly the analytes that you want to, to detect. I'll get back to this in one second. So the true question somehow which is uh, happening here with these kind of wires is can we then go one step beyond and detect relevant biomarkers in a quantitative way? Because this has been done in the past, people have been doing uh, measurements of proteins, but if we look back at the literature, essentially the systems that have been addressed here in a quantitative way were mostly biotin streptavidin, which, are, which is a great test system, but it's nothing to do with clinically relevant uh, systems, right? So it is important here to try to test systems which are uh, relevant physiologically in order to see whether the nanowires could, for instance, do the job of what is done today using surface plasmon resonance. If you want to find a new drug and you want to test the affinities, systematically people use surface plasmon resonance nowadays in principle. So the advantage here could be to have slightly higher throughput for these kind of devices. So the test system which we have been choosing in collaboration with uh, the people at the pharmacology department at the University of Basel was FIMH, which is a bacterial uh, lectin. And uh, this, this lectin is involved in, uh, in UTI. Uh, and actually, the, the colleagues have been finding that uh, by optimizing some antagonists, it was possible to have some therapeutic effects for this, uh, for this kind of uh, uh, proper ligands in this case here. So the way they have been doing these affinity screening tests was using surface plasmon resonance in this case. So we had a very good system, a test system, to try to see if our wires could do the job here. So the, the system which we have been developing, or the chip we developed, is the following. On one wire which we have been using, we used this control 
uh, ligand here in this case, which has no affinity for the female protein here. And at the same time, in parallel, we have been functionalizing uh, another wire using the proper active mannose ligand to test if things would work. So we will always compare a signal, which is the signal from the active wire minus the control wire in this case here. So this is the setup which we devised. This is again a cross-section of our system using the reference electrode. Here's the nanowire with the gold film on top uh, and the uh, functionalized surface. This is a typical characteristic of the system. We see here in a linear scale, the black curve. So we position ourselves here for the system always at the working point, which is in the linear response of the system. And we have been working at actually slightly reduced ionic strength buffer in order to optimize the signal for the wires. Uh, that was an aspect here just because of the bilength is a bit uh, larger in this case and we can see a bit more of the protein. So this is the basic experiment which we set up. This is, this is the response you see here, the response of the active wire that has the mannose linker and this is the control wire. So what we see here is that we have a dependency which is very clear in terms of concentration. Maybe I should emphasize here that the goal is not to detect physiological concentrations. The goal is to detect the binding constants here, the affinities, right? So we can work at slightly larger concentration in this case to really get the full kinetics. So we, we start to see here rather fast kinetics with a, not a saturation, but a change in the speed of, uh, of kinetics here. What you see for the control wires that we have some level of non-specific adsorption, but not too large uh, in this case here. And so essentially the wires seem to be able to detect. So we did the same experiment, or maybe before I do that, a quick, a quick mention here. So we can model that quantitatively. How do we relate the surface potential change as a function of the equilibrium dissociation constant? So we can rationalize that with this simple equation here. This is called a simple side binding model. It's maybe not so critical here. The point is that this does not depend on the type of transistor which I'm using, on the geometry of the transistor. It's totally independent. So it only depends on the surface potential uh, psi that I have here on top of my wire. So we can compare that to the surface plus one resonance signal, which is now shown here, prepared by the same hands. So the same PhD student was going back and forth between the, the machine of the surface plasmon uh, and doing the, the manipulation. So we had the same hands, we had the same proteins, we had the same guys at the same place, the same day, the same everything. And obviously it's not exactly the same, right? So there are some differences between the two uh, experiments. Here. What you see is that this signal tends to saturate a bit faster at lower concentrations of the, uh, of the female protein here. And the other thing which we can see here is that the desorption is lower in the case of the surface plus one resonance. That's one of the differences which we have in this case here. So in this case, if we fit using a simple Langmuir kinetics, the red curve, you see it fits reasonably well with a simple Langmuir fit. You can get a KD of something like five nanomolar, which is in good agreement with what is published in this case. You see that the blue fit does not fit fully. If we try to do a simple Langmuir fit of our data for the nanowires, it doesn't fit the same way. So the model is not correct, so there are some differences here. So let me try to comment uh, on the differences here, and I've been just like replotting things schematically here. In red, the signal from the silicon nanoribbons, and in black, the signal from the surface plasmon system. So what we observe is that we have slightly different association and dissociation uh, rates in this case here. So the first thing which actually was new to me, uh, which I didn't know, is that if you look in the literature, there are quite some substantial differences between SPR systems and between the people who are operating the system. So there can be quite some differences in this case here. So already between SPR systems. So that we have differences here is maybe not so critical in a sense. Now the differences that we can have here, and I summarize this in this table, it's not so critical, but one point is that the flow rates and the different surface areas which we have in the two systems, that could have a in this case here. This is the first part. So for instance, we know that the adhesion of a female is actually influenced by shear forces. This is one, one key point here. Another thing is that we could have different effective protein concentrations. That's another aspect that could intervene. What I think is happening here is that we have different sensing mechanisms intrinsically. If you think about it, the surface plasmon resonance is sensing a few hundreds of nanometers into the solution. Whereas the silicon nanowires are sensitive to the charge and this is a few nanometers. This is the lambda device screening length, which is important in this case. So what we think happens is that we are much more sensitive with the nanowires to surface reorganization effects, which are much slower. And this is why we probably see uh, a very different kinetics in this case. The second point is that we also expect to have less reabsorption of the proteins in the case of the silicon nanoribbons because the surface is also much smaller. In the case of a surface plasmon, usually the chip is much larger and that could be an additional effect. I see the chairman is standing. I should finish. Let me just skip this point maybe here briefly. I just want to wrap up 
So I try to show you that we have actually a system that is capable of doing time-resolved and label-free detection of FEMH here with a very good signal-to-noise ratio uh, based on the silicon technology. We have been using a gold surface, which has strongly reduced pH response. I did not comment too much on details here. I'm happy to come back to it. We have been able to make a direct comparison to, uh, to the SPR uh, system, and one, the main difference I think is that we have here is that we are much more sensitive to surface rearrangements in the case of the silicon nanowires. So I think this is a good tool for drug discovery. An outlook, we are interested in uh, membranes effects. Uh, at the moment, we try to deposit membranes on top of our IS vets, and I just want to advertise a little bit these guys here. We have a collaboration with the Palo Alto based startup company. They look at the effects of different antibiotics on cell and have been developed based on this technology also an assay. And uh, if you would have time to look at the correlation between these different things, the disk diffusion and their measurements, you would see that it works very well. So they have a nice startup company based on this technology, which seems to work nicely. Let me thank the people. I just want to mention Half and Matthias, who have been uh, essential for these measurements, and you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. I think we have time for some questions. not the case and maybe I can ask you a question about the noise uh, in one of the last slides I have seen there significant noise uh, and as a physicist yeah this one for example you see where, where yeah uh, so large fluctuations like this would come from bubbles which might okay. be flowing through that typically would be a difference or if that trace you would see that the black curve and the red curve are quite different we have a few bubbles passing by in the fluidics for instance that would be one reason here okay. for this noise Thank you very much. Oh, there's a question. Please. You mentioned that SPR is very cost intensive. Could you um, give some comments about this, let's say, cost potential of uh, the silicon wires? Um, well, I could invent something, but I'm not sure it would be very realistic. No, look, it's, it's uh, again, right? First, we have to demonstrate that the technology is viable. So this is the first step. Now, the point is, if you can use something that one big company, say Intel, analog devices, or whoever, is producing by billions, it's going to not cost much per chip. This is the key point. That's why this ion torrent technology was interesting. Right? And I think this is the key difference. A bi-core machine, even if you can buy a bi-core machine, which is tabletop nowadays, or SPR machine, which is small, the precision that you might get is a bit different. The point is that it's very hard to, to have one million parallel channels which are doing the things in parallel. And I think this is the potential of a silicon-based approach. You can include data analysis on chip for instance, for large data sets that you cannot do with a normal surface plasma. Not yet, maybe. I have a question. The side bandy model, is that a longer mirror or no. longer mirror? No, side, side binding model is just counting the number of groups that you have at the surface, yeah. so the number of OH groups, and which one can become O- minus or OH2+, plus, for instance, and then just going back to the surface potential based on this simple... Uh, this goes back to Bergfeld and all these guys in the 70s, this side binding model. Si site binding model. Just yeah. the one molecule binding to how many? So we just, we just look at the number of uh, active groups at the surface. Yeah. We, we count this number of groups. So essentially, in this case, you see here the response. This would be the number of surface groups, 10 to the 17 in this case, 10 to the 18, or something like this in this case here. And this is just the number of active groups which can change charge at the surface. Okay. And based on the populations of these charged or uncharged groups, we calculate the surface charge density. And from there on, we just go back to the surface potential. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, there's one question, but the real the last one here in the front. Can you give a microphone, please? I, I think he, he was still wanting to ask a question, sorry. He's, he's coming back, he's coming back. I can give you that already. Now, please. Yes, we have compared SPR detection with atomic force microscopy detection. Uh -huh. We found that SPR always underestimates binding. What's your experience with that? Always underestimates the binding in, in our case. Well, if, if, if I go back to what we had before, it's not so critical here. But if I go back and try to fit here, I would using a, a very naive Langmuir kinetics, I would get a binding constant which is one to two orders of magnitude larger than what BIAC or, or surface plasma resonance is giving. Mm -hmm. So it might be also underestimating in that case. 
I mean, but again, it's, it's, I think it's a different binding mechanism that, that we have also. So this is this naive plot here, this naive graph. I think that part, let's say the surface plasmon is not very sensitive to the details of the first few nanometers yeah. above the surface, whereas I think our wires are much more sensitive in that regime. So any reorganization at the surface taking place to reorganize the self assembly monolayer of the mannose receptor at the surface, this is a time constant which is different and you're almost saturated in the curve here already, but we still have a much longer kinetics because it takes much more time to reorganize the surface layer. That's my naive picture at the moment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's wrong to give only one binding constant in this case, probably because we have two different processes taking place. That would be my understanding here. Okay, I think we have to continue <laughs> and uh, maybe the discussion can be continued during the break. And I 